All right, everyone, I am Lindsay, and I'm here to present on excavating digital fossils to y'all. So like Jonathan said, we've been around for about seven years at the Digital Research Lab. And the four things that we do are scan, segment, study, and share. Each of those is a critical step for all the things that we're working on. We don't have a scanner on site, but we do partner with a lot of people who, to scan fossils for our lab. And I am the lead digital preparator, and my team and I process these computed tomography scans and create 3D models of the specimens that we've scanned. So what is computed tomography? It's very fancy x-rays. So these are x-rays taken at increments across a specimen. So think of it as a, a sliced loaf of bread. And this is a non-destructive tool. It's also non-invasive. And it creates a three-dimensional model of the actual specimens that we're scanning. The great thing about this is that it actually lets us see inside of specimens. So it can penetrate rocks. It can penetrate through the fossil material. And we can really see the insides of bones. So this is an example of what these scans really look like. And I've marked two elements in the scan. There's about four or five in here, but we'll look at two. The first one is the premaxilla and the maxilla. So this is the maxilla here, and you can see these little tiny kind of marks there. Those are the alveoli. So those are where teeth go. And if we wanna look at the premax, they're even more obvious. So we've got some more here. If we scroll back and forth, you can kind of see those shapes forming. And if I go all the way to the bottom, you can actually see the teeth. So that's what these really bright white specimens are. Those are teeth. And when we're looking at these scans, it's really just a lot of gray colors and there's all different kinds of shapes. And the gray colors tell us the density of the elements in the scan. So if an object is really dense, like bone or enamel on teeth, it shows up really bright. And if it's not as dense, if it's maybe air, it shows up very dark. So in this scan, we have a mix of materials. A lot of what you see around it is air. And then every now and then you'll see some of those fossil materials. And this scan is actually one of the more challenging ones that we've worked with. So if I show you a sneak peek in 3D, this is actually what it looks like. And you can get a really good visual of these fossils in here with the matrix around them. So here's that premaxilla and you can see those really nice teeth. Here's another maxilla here. So these two bones together would make the front of the dinosaur snout, complete with the nasal. That makes that whole face that you see. So let's look at a 3D model of this. This is work that was completed by a volunteer in my lab who is now pursuing his PhD. And he uses this technology a lot for his research. So this yellow one here is the maxilla. This is one of the upper jaw bones and it has lots of teeth in it. One of the things I love about these scans is that with dinosaurs like this, their teeth are replaced throughout their whole life. So you can see all the teeth that are growing to replace the teeth that they're losing inside of these scans. And I have a really good example of that coming up. Together, these two bones would have made the right upper jaw. And this part right here is actually fused nasal bone. So bones on each side of the, the nose have fused together to make this single kind of complex. And then this orange one down here is a bone, but it's so small and fragmentary that we can't really tell what it is. We know that it has the makeup of bone and it looks like bone in the scan, but there's not enough of it to actually figure out what bone of the face it was. So let's talk about what they look like before they get scanned. There's really three main ways we scan our fossils. We scan them after they've been prepped, we scan them with some of the removal of the matrix, so they're partially prepared. And some of them we scan not prepared at all. So we just collect them from the field, put them in a field jacket, and send them off to be scanned. These are usually really large size specimens. And they are typically the most difficult to process. So they have a lot of extra rock matrix around them, and they have a lot of protective material keeping the fossil safe for transport. And over here on the side, you can see what some of these fossils look like when they're being scanned. These big white jackets, those are actually full-size fossils and they are pretty large. These are about as long as my arm span and I'm five feet tall, so imagine how long they are. And this one down here, this one is actually 
about 550 kilograms in weight and it's about a meter across. So it's really, really huge and it's full of fossils. And one of the reasons we scan these really, really big blocks is so that we can actually see what's inside before we start any physical preparation on it. So we do this to kind of help the people who are mechanically prepping fossils have a map of what to expect when they actually get in the jacket and start prepping matrix away. I believe I have some samples. So this is a unprepped concretion and you can see some of the elements in here. This is what we're really looking for when we get a rock that might have a fossil in it, but we're not sure. We look through the scan and we look for some patterns. So as you kind of scroll through here, we're moving from the tip of the snout down to the back of the skull. And all of these things that are popping up very slowly, these are all teeth. So where there's teeth, there's usually a skull for the most part. In this case, because we have two sets of teeth and we have some very slight bone in there, we know that there's probably a complete skull in this block. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. Tooth roots have a pretty characteristic appearance. They hold neurovasculature, so nerves and arteries and veins to feed the tooth. And in a really well-preserved fossil, those spaces stay hollow. And those are really good hallmarks for knowing that you found a tooth. And if you can look at the tooth, it can also tell you what kind of animal it belongs to. Occasionally with some of these, we get artifacts. And the artifact can be an image artifact, so something that happens when it scans, or it can be an artifact of the fossil process. And in this one, we actually had some plant roots come through and kind of move through these bones. So that's what this kind of funky little shadow is. That is not actually an anatomical feature. That's just an artifact of being a fossil. The most common specimen that we usually see in our lab are partially prepared specimens. So these are fossils that have been collected and have at least one surface exposed. So you can see some of those fossil elements just sitting on the surface there. And these are actually really great to scan because it means they have a, a good bone air boundary, which helps with the density values. The density is the key for all of these scans. So it helps us know what's bone and what's matrix. And it also gives us a really good idea of where we should look for things because some of it's exposed on the surface. Most of the data we work with comes from these kind of partially prepared specimens. And so they all have a really characteristic look of usually very clear bone with some matrix around it too. The matrix is the rock material that these fossils are found in. This is a skull of a very small turtle. And a lot of what you're seeing in here are actually true to the biology of the specimen. We've got some really nice suture lines in here. You can see the way that the bones are different. This is part of a jawbone versus the dermal bones, which make up the face of the skull. And if we look at this in 3D, it's actually quite lovely and so cute. This is a specimen called Sahonachilles, and this is a really tiny turtle. It's about the size, just a little bit over the size of a quarter, this whole skull here. So it's pretty tiny. Being able to see all of that detail is really remarkable. Um, and it's really important because these are the kinds of things we're looking for. So this piece is actually in three different sections. It got crushed when it was collected and we were able to scan all three pieces. So it's a mostly complete skeleton here. And as I move it around, you can still see some of those little tiny pieces of rock that have a higher density than the rest of it. Not quite as dense as our bone here, but it's still a little bit more dense than the air and the matrix around it. This was the first specimen that we processed in the digital research lab, and we did bone by bone analysis. So we identified as many of the individual bones of the skull as possible using those 2D images to track where the bones meet. And then we also did some preliminary endocasting, which is where we go in and we make models of hollow space where soft tissue was living when this animal was alive. So we can look at the shapes of brains and ear structures and get an idea of what this animal was doing when it was alive. Here's another example of some partially prepared specimens. Over here at the top, this is what the, the field jacket looks like. So this is actually plaster and burlap. And then all of this different kind of gray gradient, this is all rock matrix. So it's a really good example of Sometimes the rock that's around these fossils varies as you collect a section, 
So even the rock that's around one bone can look very different. And the bone is up here at the top of the scan. So we're going to kind of scroll through and see some really interesting features. This is actually three bone pieces. And this is the forearm of a really small mammal from Colorado Springs. This is an animal from right after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So this is a recovery animal. And what I really love about this one is that it is actually an articulated elbow joint of a juvenile animal. And I say that it's a juvenile because when we look at the scan, the high resolution scan that we really have, this is the radius. This is the articular end. So this is actually the piece that makes up the joint. And right here is an epiphyseal line that is a growth line. So as we're growing, our bones don't fully fuse until we get to our maximum height. And if we have unfused bones, that indicates this animal is not skeletally mature. So this is a juvenile specimen, which is always really exciting to find because the bones don't fuse all the way, they get lost really easily. So whenever we can find a subadult, it's really exciting stuff. And then here it will be the beautiful 3D model of these three bony elements. We'll be able to look at all of them in space together and see how they articulate. And if you're familiar with human anatomy, this looks very similar to a modern human humerus and a modern human radius and a modern human ulna. They look so similar. It was very clear to know what part of the body we were looking at when we saw this. And they're very well preserved. So this is exactly how they are. This is what we call in situ. So this is how they were collected, how they were fossilized. And we've prepped out all of the rock matrix around it while still keeping these bones isolated from each other. So if we wanted to, we could 3D print each one of these bones separately and take measurements from them or put them into models to simulate kind of movements. So here's another one of our very challenging data sets. And this kind of very bright line right here, this is what I call an image artifact. What's going on right here is that this particular fossil actually has some metallic inclusions in it. And when you CT scan metal, it gets really bright halo artifacts. So you get these lines that kind of throw off your regular variable values, but you can still see in some places there's some pretty nice bone in here. This scan looks really challenging, and don't get me wrong, it was very challenging. But we did have a couple of volunteers and interns who were able to really pull out a lot of fossil material from this scan. It took them a very long time because it is a very challenging specimen. The density values between the matrix and the fossil are really similar. So separating those two takes a lot of time. And then here you can see some of the teeth. So we've got a lower jawbone here with some teeth. Most of the skull is up in this region, and this is all part of the neck. This is from the apex predator from Cretaceous Madagascar. So this is a theropod dinosaur called Majungosaurus, very similar to a T-Rex, so a meat-eating dinosaur. And this is actually the final video of the, the last step of work that our volunteer had done before he left to go to school. And each different color on here indicates a separate bone that was identified and segmented out. And you can see some of them are slightly partial where you get deeper into the matrix and it's a lot harder to separate fossil from rock. But overall, this is a very, very great segmentation of an incredibly difficult scan to process. So a lot of material is in here. And the great thing about this, the specimen lives in our collections, but it's never going to be prepared more than it is now. So any future preparation to create a model or to print this has to be done digitally. It's a tough one. All of the, the dense material in that matrix also make it really hard to physically prep. So it's a problem that we both share sometimes, physical and digital. And this is another partially prepped skeleton. Um, this one's actually really beautiful to look at. It's very well prepared. There's not much matrix left. You can see a lot of the bone in here. So this is a really great scan to work on. It has really clean density values. You can see a lot of the bones that are in there. And when we start looking at actual segmentations, it's a really, really nice model that we've been able to make. 
This one is actually one of our favorites. This is also a mammal. This is the same mammal as the elbow joint, but this is the skull. And what you're looking at here is actually an endocast of the brain and some of the neurostructures. So in gold, we had cranial nerves and these fun loops. Those are the semicircular canals that attach to the cochlea and make up the organs of hearing and balance. And when we have these things preserved in animals, we can actually take measurements of the cochlea and the angles of the semicircular canals and compare them with living animals and find out the frequencies they were able to hear and also potentially some of their locomotion habits. So this is a really awesome specimen. We were able to do a bone by bone segmentation. So you can see each individual color is a bone that's been identified. And we actually have some collaborators who are working on reconstructing this. So fixing the deformity of fossilization. This one was really compressed and they're actually pulling it out and making it look more like how it would have looked when it was alive. More endocasting technology. This specimen's really tiny. This specimen is about the size of my thumb, this skull. And these are the inner ear structures of this teeny tiny, maybe early lizard, maybe early turtle. We're still trying to figure it out. Um, but you can see here, it has two ears on each side. They look very different from our human ears. Um, and we also have one ear bone, a stapes, which is pretty exciting because very, very early animals did not have ear bones. So this is kind of a transition animal. It's pretty cool to see. The least challenging specimens that we have are the ones that have had all their matrix removed from the surface. This means when we scan it, the x-rays go really deep into the specimen and we can see the clearest view of the internal anatomy of these animals. So whenever we get to scan these, we get really excited because we know the results are gonna be stunning. And I will show you how they look. We'll start with the maxilla. So this is the Majungasaurus maxilla that was scanned after it was prepared. There is still a little bit of matrix inside the jaw but you can see there's teeth already starting to form here. This tooth is actually loose. So if this animal had lived a little bit longer, it probably would have lost this tooth and had this other one come in to replace it. As you scroll through, you start to see other parts of the bone. This is actually the part that reaches up and forms the orbit of the eye. We've got lots of dental anatomy in here. And it's very cool to see how many teeth it was growing before it died. Let's get a look at it. 3D. So these are all the teeth that were exposed. This is that one that was about to fall out. And back here, these are tiny teeth that had just erupted. So they were just finally making their way out. This section here is that portion that makes up the front of the eye. And it's really thin compared to the rest of the bone. So that's why it has this kind of transparent look. The thinner the bone is, the less dense it is. So all of this section here where we have teeth forming, there's lots of dense bone in here. It's really opaque. This is one that we 3D print a lot because everybody loves dinosaurs and dinosaur teeth. So this is the 3D model that we usually use to print. And all of these lines that you see are actually the lines from the scan itself. So when we do our scans, the density or the resolution of each scan is based on how thick the slices are. So these lines that you see that is actually equivalent to the thickness of each slice that we're looking at when we make this scan. And when we get ready to print this, we can actually smooth some of that out so that it looks more like a bone and less like a 3D scan. But it's always nice to know where your data comes from. This is another jaw of an even smaller theropod animal. And it was prepared on the outside. And as you can see, there's matrix in here. We've got some really nice dental bone here. So this is actually the lower jaw of an unknown theropod dinosaur from about 150 million years ago, but it also has that pattern. So we have this tooth here that's forming, this tooth has already erupted, and this tooth would have made its way out to make room for this one as this dinosaur aged. Jury's still out on whether or not this is an adult or a juvenile. It is a very small little little dinosaur, so it could have been a juvenile, but maybe it was just small when it was fully grown. And this is an upper jaw. This upper jaw goes to the same animal as the lower jaw that we just looked at. This one has a lot more anatomy and more features. It's a more complicated bone than a lower jaw is. 
and we have lots of teeth in here and more hollow spaces. So the interesting thing about these upper jaws is that they have what we call sinuses. And these are basically just air pockets that help make bones lighter on your face. And typically there's soft tissue in them. There can be blood and nerves in there traveling to the teeth and innervating other parts of the face. But it also helps a lot when you're a big dinosaur or even a small dinosaur, helping your bones to be lightweight so that you can actually move and carry your skull around. These two bones were actually a project of our teen science scholars in 2019. And their project was to segment each of those elements, so the lower jaw and the upper jaw. And I have one video of the final product of the upper jaw segmentation. So you can see it's a really nice, cute little jaw here. These were all the teeth that they identified. This purple is actually the neurovascular canal. So these were actually where nerves were traveling inside of this bone to supply the teeth, to supply the face, traveling all through this bone. It's visible in the scan and our team was able to segment it. And it tells us a lot about maybe how much innervation inside this animal, how much sensory systems it relied on. Thanks for all your patience while my models load. This is another specimen that we scanned after it was prepared. This is my dear friend, Tinia Labus, this is a mammal from right after the extinction of the dinosaurs. And this one's from Crow Bluffs in Colorado Springs. So we do a lot of work with this one. And what's really interesting about this specimen right here, this tooth has been infected and it got pushed out, but it healed over. So this is an anatomical abnormality. It's a pathology, but it also indicates that this animal had an infection and this infection didn't kill it. It survived and its, its jaw bones actually grew around the infection and preserved the tooth in space. Something that we don't see very often, but it's very cool when you do see it. And it shows up in even the human fossil record. We have a lot of skulls that have this kind of pathology to them. And this is that specimen. These are the inner ear structures of that little model that we just saw. So looking for hollow spaces in these to create models of some of those soft tissue structures. We're always interested in seeing more. And this is our first non-fossil scan. I have to show this because it is just gorgeous. And I apologize if anybody has arachnophobia. This is a wolf spider. This is the head of a wolf spider that has undergone a special treatment in order to show all of the different values of the grayscale tissues in here. It's called DICE. It's Diffuse Iodine Contrast Enhancement Scanning. So they took this little spider, they dunked it in a little cup of iodine for a little while, it absorbed some of that iodine and it attached to some of the tissues in here. So right here we have eyes and these are all muscle fibers, which are really interesting. I was amazed at how many were actually inside this specimen. These are the fangs right here. So as we're moving down, you can see how they come off of those, the face right there. And this is moving in towards the abdomen and thorax. So lots of soft tissue structures inside this invertebrate animal, super cool. We don't get to see this very often, but it's pretty awesome. And it's even cooler in 3D. Let's look at it and check it out. So this is the back end. And what's great about these scans is that they even preserved hairs. So the tiny little hairs that are on these animals, you can see. And as you manipulate through this, you can see some of the different features that show up. Here's the other eyes. It has eight, as most spiders do, I suppose. And they're all really cool. And you can actually see them all in the CT scan. So this was done for some internal anatomy research. And we're hoping that we can CT scan some more of our invertebrate specimens using this technique and get some more cool anatomy knowledge. Let's see, this one is the surprise. This one is always fun to share. We have two mummies on display at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And in the past, we did CT scanning of these specimens to see inside of them and compare their skeletons and their mummification process and just get a look at inside and see what their anatomy looks like. And I was able to work on this one. And we've got all of these are bundles of organs that were removed and then replaced. 
We've got some really nice bone elements to help use as landmarks. This is a really nice vertebral body and here's the spinal canal. So that's where the spinal cord lives. And all of this stuff around it, these are all the linen wrappings. This is a layer of resin that sealed that first layer of linen and then it was wrapped again with linen and sealed with another layer of resin. So that's how these bodies were able to be preserved for so long. And then we get up into the skull and start seeing a lot of these cranial elements. There's no brain in here. And there is a really large hole right here in the nose, the cribiform plate. So it's possible that this is where that brain was removed. Right here are where the eyes would be. And then we come up to the top and see all of it. So this is a really interesting specimen um, to compare with the other one that we have in our exhibit because this one had a more traditional type of burial. So for this one, it was having all of its organs removed, replaced after they were treated. And the other uh, mummy that we have on display did not have all of those things done. And it's coming to term that it was because they were, they were mummified at different times. So the traditions changed when this one was mummified versus the later one that didn't have all of the same um, burial wrappings and shrouds attached with it. So it's very interesting to look at. One of my favorite things about this is when we look at the skeleton and we look at the cross section of the limbs, you can actually see the muscle groups that you would expect to see on a modern living human. So if I was to go get a CT scan, these would still be the same organization that I have in my body. So it's kind of cool to see a 3000 year old person from the inside out. And that is the last slide that I have for y'all. Let's see what the questions are. Wow. Um, well, a, a, a digital thank you to <laughs> this amazing presentation. Uh, this is just kind of mind blowing. Um, wow. So yeah, let's open it up to some uh, questions here. Okay, so we have a question. Um, what are they using the wolf spider data set for? That's a really great question. Um, the wolf spider data set is actually a surprise data set that we did not know was from our collections. Um, our spider curator, Paula Cushing, she had loaned the specimen out many years ago to someone and they were, forgot to tell us that they posted the data online. And so I found it and it was just too remarkable to pass up. So we brought it back to our attention. And now that Paula knows that this technology is out there, she's already starting to plan a lot of projects um, for other kinds of spiders in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, one of the ideas that she had, which is very useful for DICE CT scanning, is to compare high altitude spiders with low altitude spiders and see how their uh, respiratory system is different. If it is different, it probably is because there is a, a specific line where certain spiders are found above but not below and certain spiders are found below and not above. So that's one of the projects that we're thinking about. And if we get to do that, I can't wait to see the data because it's going to be beautiful. Awesome. Okay. We have a question. <clears throat> Did you learn anything surprising from the mummy scan? Yes, this mummy scan was was the fancy mummy scan. This had a lot of artifacts buried and tucked in within the linen layers. So we were actually able to isolate those and create models of the trinkets and different metals that were wrapped in for protection. And this one also had um, coins placed on the eyes. So we were able to isolate those elements and create some digital models where people can actually see those features overlaid on the the digital model of the full mummy. And because we have these 3D files of them, we could also 3D print them. So we can print replicas of the burial amulets that these mummies have. So speaking of that, another question, um, is the mummy from ancient Egypt or a different place? Yes, this mummy is from Egypt. And we actually did reach out to the Egyptian um, archaeology team and asked if they would want us to repatriate the mummies that we have. And they actually gave a surprising answer. They said that so many of their mummies have been excavated and collected that they have no idea how to even begin repatriating them. And that keeping it here where we have knowledge about it makes the most sense for them at this time. 